I am a human being and I killed human beings. Before I knew it, I'd fired four shots at the door. I kept on shouting for Reva to phone the police. Tests are underway to determine if a serial killer is on the loose in Centurion, Pretoria. The dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. In South Africa, 71 people are murdered every day. These are the stories of Africa's killers and criminals and what it takes to catch them. My name is Paul Llewellyn, I'm a journalist and true crime filmmaker, and my co-host as always to discuss crime on the continent is Jared Labaskachny, the former cop and current head of LNS Threat Management, who led the investigative psychology section of the South African Police Service from 2001 until 2016. In his time there, he worked on over 300 serial murder and rape cases, and he is the profiler. Please visit our YouTube page and subscribe, search Profiler Africa, Please do subscribe, and um, uh, we highly recommend you listen to the podcast on YouTube too. Uh, we're available on Apple and Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Simply search Profiler. Uh, please share your favorite link. You can engage with us on our social pages. Our Twitter and Instagram handle is at Profiler Africa, or you can email us uh, Profiler Africa info at gmail.com. That's Profiler Africa info at gmail.com. Con. So, a few weeks ago, we introduced you to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Yanni Delanga, who has now retired uh, from the police. He was a, uh, a member of the police from uh, way back in 1987, so was uh, a part of the South African police over, for an amazing period and, and had a, an, an illustrious career there. Worked very closely with Gerard in the investigative psychology section um, for a number of years. And um, today we are lucky to have um, Yanni back with us, um, as we promised previously, to discuss a, a, a specific case that he worked on, and a very interesting one. Um, Jared, how are you doing, first of all? Nice to see you again. Yep, doing all right, thanks. Year are you started, well? You're on the go, yeah. Yes, the year is, 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 is turning out to be a pretty interesting one, I think. Mm -hmm. um, managing to to find some interesting folks to talk to on the podcast um please do suggest any specific episodes that you'd like us to talk about um we are going to kind of incorporate more and more and more and more of your input into the podcast as we try to uh, evolve what it is that we do um i'd like to welcome yanni back to the the podcast again hi yanni how are you fine yourself thank you very much Great. How, how's how's retirement going? How's this? How's the last couple of weeks of retirement been since we spoke last? I'm still feeling about on pension on holiday. <laughs> still feeling like he's on holiday. <laughs> I think that's well, pretty much how how retirement goes, isn't it? It's just like one big long holiday now. So so it's, we must check in, in six months' time. We'll check back in again and hope maybe it's become work then. And so you, we're finding that you're. More, you're more more inclined to to get back to, to 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 investigating in some way, shape, or form. Um, we're going to discuss a very interesting case today: the case of Anisha van Niekerk, the murder of Anisha van Niekerk. Where do we start with this one, guys? Who wants to who wants to kick us off? Well, I think what I always found interesting is I, I typically would not really take much time off in December, and Yanni, I don't think you ever took time off in December. Um, and it was always interesting that there often seemed to be a December case, mm. a kind of defined December. And what I always said was nice about it is typically because things have wound down, there's not much going on. You, people are kind of hanging around the office, mm. you know, specifically mm. when we were still at Sears and Barnum Crime Head Office. So you've got lots of office bries. When I say office bry, I mean a bry in the actual office. Um, <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. Indoors? Indoors, yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah. And, um, okay. and often a case would just come along that kind of, people would just all be jumping onto because, you know, there's not much else that they're up to. And, and I think this was kind of one of those cases. Um, we had one, I don't know if it was a year before or after this, where the woman was murdered who went to go help some people move some stuff. Also in that general oh, area, Boschkop, yeah, yeah, Boschkop, yeah. and then they found a body. So this was, I think, one of those. And um, I can't even, I mean, how did you get involved with this, Yanni? Um, the the branch commander of Belbeck Police Station phoned me and of course, I was previously work at the Albuquerque Police Station. He knows me. He phoned me. He said, "Listen, here, we found the body of a white female, about a kilometer and a half from the police station, and decomposed or starting decomposing. And they know I'm working on on zero rape cases and zero murder cases. If I can come and help them, so I said for sure, and I went to the crime scene. 
Now, tell us a little for for our um, uh, non South African and non non Gauteng uh, uh, listeners. Tell us a little bit about Valbekent. Valbekent is a farming area between uh, Babsfontein and Bronkospreit. Um, it's more plots and farms. There's no uh, the only two houses on Valbekent is the police station and houses. Um, it's it's supposed to be that the farm area is the plus on Bekent. But because the, the, the post always came back from, from the post office, they changed the police station to Val Bekent. So the only place, Val Bekent, is only the police station. Oh. Yeah. The, the rounding areas is the farm on, on, the farm on Bekent. Which, which is for those don't speak yes. Afrikaans, mean unknown. <laughs> so I think you once told me they would send post and it would be the post office would just 566 the post office or unknown mm. so all the stuff would come back we said but why you know you're sending something to an unknown post office but no that's it's the, the town was called Ornbekin or the farm was called yeah. Ornbekin so they yeah. didn't change it to Velbekin which means well known yes <laughs> So, now, uh, am I correct in saying that you have a, a history in this area? Yes, I was the bronze commander there from 1990 to 92. Okay. So you know this community yes. intimately. Yes. Um, and you know kind of... So what, is the, what, what are the typical kinds of crimes that you would, that you would have experienced no, in this area? No, it was mostly housebreakings, assault cases during weekends, um, small on farms, housebreakings and stealing stuff. Some few cattle, sto- uh, cattle or sheep steel cases, but but, the, the, but murder is not typical. No, okay. No. In South Africa, it's not just murder cases that pop up in December. It's also we also seem to be famous in December for there being some idiot racist making some terrible <laughs> comment on the internet. But, everyone, but then for you guys, obviously, it was a, a case would pop up. So this was the third of December in two thousand and seven, if I'm correct. Um, that. The body that the body yeah, was yeah. found. Uh, where do we go from? Kick us off then. So, so where did you guys get started? You get called to this crime scene. So I went straight to the crime scene, and uh, the body was really uh, removed when I came to the crime scene. But uh, I found the, fo- the crime scene photos later during the day, and um, the body was lying on on, on her stomach. Um, she was naked off fr- from her waist down, and. Um, Started decomposing already, and only some significant on, on the crime scene was about 12 meters from a crime scene. A pair of ray bands was found next to the body, about 12 meters from the body. That was standing out for me because you can see it doesn't it doesn't fit there. Hmm. So then the ray start to try to, to identify the victim because your investigating start from if you know who it is. So. Um, the body was removed to the, to the post to um, forensic to uh, post mortem people, and we tried to. We, I sent people from forensics to try to get the fingerprints from from the body to try to identify them. Just this time of the year, it's the beginning of December, it's the beginning of summer, it's hot. I imagine that Valbekent is particularly hot yes. at this time of year. So, so just let's talk about when you arrive at one of the first. What are some of the first things you will do when you arrive on a crime scene? I mean, obviously, I would imagine that the local police have cordoned off the area mm-hmm. and just kind of set the perimeter and are managing the space. What do you do when you walk onto the crime scene? And what are your what what are some of the realities when it comes to the level of decomposition at this time of year in particular? Well, the first thing is that the, the crime scene must be photographed. And, and so you try not to walk onto the crime scene, not before the crime scene experts were there to do the crime scene. They must take first take the photos of the crime scene, uh, then try to be there's only one way in, one way out, um, just not to disturb the surrounding areas. But because the, the body was starting to decompose already, and there was, looks like there was rain during those, those times, there was nothing else standing out on this crime scene except this pair of uh, right bars. Okay. What did you, what did you, Assume the, the 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 time period to be that the body had been there from the from the amount of decomposition that because I mean I just looking at the photographs the body looks pretty decomposed to me it was at, at least a week okay from so, from my experience I thought it might be at least a week or late or, or longer and do you recall who found the body yes it was it was a, a guy that went there to, to relieve himself next to the road. And, and he walked into the farm area, okay. about two meters, 
and then he saw the, the well, I think he saw and he smelled the body. Okay, so everything's photographed. Um, the body is then removed to be, and you were at the point where now you were trying to identify who this person is. Yes, but at that point, I mean, you, were you? Did you know you were going to end up taking over the investigation? No, no. You were just there, sort of assisting whoever yes. was the docket carrier. That's right. Okay, so uh, everyone understands again. So a local officer would have been running the case already, essentially from mm. the from the Valbekent station. That's right. Okay, and then you're called in to assist. That's right. Yes. Okay identification how did that process how did we identify who the victim was so we tried to get the fingerprints from from the body and and uh, running the fingerprints through our face but we couldn't get any luck from there so about a few days later um somebody phoned me from the station and said listen here there's a, a guy yet at the station and said his sister is missing and they want to take him to the body to show him the body and i said you can't take him to the body because th- there's nothing to show to them so I said, only thing that you must do is give me, let me get me an ID number. So he phoned the mother and the mother sent me the ID number. And through the ID number from Home Affairs, we identify her as Anisha Faniger. So that was his sister, the brother that was doing yes. this. Yes. That's interesting because, I mean, if, if as we jump a bit forward, I don't want to ruin that sort of information. This is a relatively far distance from where the victim stayed. So, I mean, did he go to hundreds of police, not hundreds, did he go to a whole bunch of police stations? What happened is there was also a big up, bus up on, on this, from the start of the investigation. She was reported missing in, in Kempton Park where she stays. And they were supposed to send the missing person information to head office, but that didn't happen. So only in, in Kempton Park, in, at the local places, a photo was up as missing persons and everything. And then the, the local newspapers put an article about the body that we found. And the whole story about this young girl was found a kilometer from the police station, decomposed. And he saw the article in the newspaper about a body was found at the Albuquerque police station. That's how we came around. Okay. And that's how we get the ID numbers and we identified her as Anisha Fanica. Would that have been because you then got a fingerprint from Home Affairs yes. and asked them to compare them to the crime scene that's prints, right. fingerprints okay okay so that's nice that that happens because i always i've always in my mind had the the kind of home affairs fingerprints database as not accessible to the police but it is if you know the right person, people not, to call it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's you, not a physio yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> if you know but but you yes. got you know the person to call up like but i think to identify bodies previous. you can't they will allow the fingerprints to be run through their database if i'm not mistaken yes, it's done, yeah. but otherwise officially no officially yes. no. For any but, other reason mm-hmm. okay but unofficially sometimes mm-hmm. okay maybe <laughs> <laughs> okay fine um the, i just want to put this down to you had your ways and your means of accessing that database which mm-hmm. were perfectly acceptable at the time um what were some of the other standout things from the body on the scene? I mean, the fact that, that I know Jared often speaks about a, a body being found that's partially naked or, or completely naked, that there immediately start to be an assumption of some kind of sexual component there. Were there were there things like that that stood out about the body itself from the crime scene? Yes, and, and, and also the, the whole face was 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 smashed up. Okay. So the, the whole skull, um, skull was, was broken. And then my point of view was also that she wasn't murdered there because there was no scaffold around it. Like there was any um, scaffold around the crime scene. It just looked like she was just dumped there. We're talking about a dumping site. So this looked like to me to a dumping site. Mm-hmm. She was murdered somewhere else and just left there. So there was no blood evidence, or blood spatter or, no. or disturbance in the immediate vicinity. No. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Then wh- where do you go from there? So you've got so, a, an identified body. You know this is Anisha. Um, is this where you now start to find out more? And, uh, yeah. So then, then it came out that she was reported missing on the twenty fifth of November, okay, two thousand and seven, and we found her on the third December. So it was now eight nine days that she was meant missing. But from the beginning, the, the brother told me the story that the stepfather. Um, was last seen with her and he said he dropped her off by her friend's house and that doesn't sound correct to them or something is not up with the story that they've been telling. And then, so from the beginning, something was not right for us with the story was he was telling. So um, I've 
contact the parents and I said, listen, yeah, I want to meet you. And then they said, but they want to come to my office. I said, no, I want to come to your house. So what I've done, I've organized with Crumpsy Management to follow me to, to her house where she was staying, to, to speak to the parents and then also to form, inform the parents because then the parents didn't know that we, I did uh, already. Okay. So I went there also to do the death notification. But our crime scene people was, was waiting outside for me. Um, so after I told the, the, the marvelous senior, we found your daughter. It is your daughter. She was found next to the, to the road and everything. So then I said to him, the senior, I want to invest. Tell me where she sleep and where she stayed. And we showed me the room. I said, then I want to do forensics on her bedroom. And, and so this everything. was the, the mother and the stepfather present yes. at this point. Yes. And, and I told the stepfather from the beginning, you know, you're the last person with her. So unfortunately for you, you are going to be investigating. Investigated to see, can I exclude you from everything? Yeah. And he said, no problem. So while we were crimes and people came in, and then he told me the story that he, um, they all went, there was a, it was a Sunday afternoon, they have a bride at the house, she was in a bikini, swimming at the swimming pool, and then they decided they're going out to the club for the night to a, to a restaurant for a dance and eat. And she and him will drive with the motorcycle. The mother will, will follow them in his bucket. And this is quite, this isn't close by where you no, can stay. Is, this no. is like on the other side the of other Johannesburg. Side of Joburg. Okay. So the white where they the, were the going bar, out. The place where they're going to go have drinks. And, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So he, the, the, okay, yeah, okay. So his story was they went there to, for the at the club, uh, eat there and dance, and he was and she was dancing to each other with his stepdaughter. She's nineteen years old, twenty years, nineteen years. And so when they left, the mother left before them. You know, they left together. The mother left, and they were on the motorcycle going home. But when the mother picked up at home, they, he wasn't there. He only arrived later. And when she asked him, but where is my daughter? He said, I drop off a friend's house. And when she found a friend, the friend said, but where did he drop me off? Because I'm not staying where you say I'm staying. Mm -hmm. Anisha know that I moved. So that was Bell's house. Okay. So I asked him, where was, what is, where's the clothes that she when he was wearing? So he gave me his motorcycle helmet, her helmet, all his clothes he was wearing, and he was also bringing her jacket that she was wearing. He brought the jacket back and the helmet back. So he dropped off without the helmet, without the jacket, and a purse with a cell phone, with a cigarettes, were at the house. So he also had those. I didn't know. Okay. Okay. Just just before we carry on, just tell us a little bit about Anisha. What what you know? Tell, what was she? She was three months before this event. The mother and, and father get married, and the stepfather. Okay. But she was in, in, in London, in, on, on working in London. So she came back for a sister's wedding. It was supposed to happen the week after she went missing. Okay. So she was, she was missing when the wedding went, went to place. Oh, yeah. So she came only for, and she only met the stepfather that week. But oh. she was here. Okay, so this was a relatively new relationship. New relationship. Everything was new. So okay. she never... Then um, I asked him what I want. I want the, the, the jacket and the helmets. I want to take it for forensics. And he said, no problem, you can take it. Then I said to him, also, I want you to take off your your, your T-shirt, your, your shirt. I was going to examine you myself check if you got anything and he got a one scratch mark on his back of his of his on his back and i asked him what, what is this scratch mark he said to me no i was catching the roses and that scratched my back and then i said to him but i want that to be also examined by a medical doctor to give me a full report on your he said no problem i will go and he went with our gave him a detective took him to a doctor to do a full examination took photos of it that's done. And um, I sent all these things to forensics, and now you must wait. Did, did he give you a formal statement? He gave me a formal statement. Mm. Exactly what I'm telling you, the same thing, how he went there. 
just to, this is so the, the, the gentleman's name is Gerard Stephanus Williamson. Tell us a little bit, you know, just describe him. How 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 old is he? You know, and what is his general demeanor like when? So he seems quite casual. He when was happy very to casual. Cooperate. I can't remember his age, but I think he was in his mid fifties. Okay, um, okay. um, working from home, uh, doing selling uh, car parts to for somebody else, like a rep. And okay. his bucky was there, what he was using with all these tools, with all his equipment that he was selling to people. But the story what I got from the from from her from the beginning was, he's the guy that I'm talking about. The girls, the guy with a tassie. Guy that comes with you with a tassie, he's only got a two bras and, and maybe a, a pair of pants. Yeah. He got nothing on his name. Come into the relationship. Coming into the relationship with nothing. Okay. So I always talk the guy with a tassie, then he was he was run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was his story. But the first thing you you start, I got his ID number, so I draw his profile from our yes. records, and then all the all the lights go on. This guy was involved in in rape cases. In, in assault cases. Of people who knew cases. and people who were strangers or f- family, I mean, like. Yeah. Family members, his girlfriends, his fiancés, girlfriends, the children that he molested, he was charged for. I'm talking about 19, 20 cases. And, and, and so Jane, who was Anisha's mother, would not have been, was not aware of not, any of this aware criminal aware background. Of anything of this, nothing. And had he served time? Had he been incarcerated? No, never. We have been, have been found guilty of what, a couple he of He was them, a found right? guilty of a couple of it, but like fines. He will get the 500 rand fine yeah. or something like that. So it's, you know, it's less. Some of, um, some of, most of the cases, and for he was withdrawn by the parents. The parents will open the cases to five year gold, gold in the senior. When you have a bride, you will come in, you found of me. Some of the mothers didn't believe the children. Some of the mothers will open cases, but then we'll withdraw the cases. They said, no, we don't want to get the children to go through this drama again with court mm-hmm. cases. For stuff. But, but I mean, there's, where there's smoke, there's fire. I mean, we always say, if you've been arrested 20 times for assault, but you've never been convicted mm-hmm. that you have an assault problem. I mean, I've never been arrested for assault. I'm sure you have, Paul. Mm-hmm. So even things that don't go over to you being prosecuted, like domestic violence, how many times do you see people open up cases and it gets mm-hmm. withdrawn by the, the, the girlfriend or the wife the next day? So a lot of things to get withdrawn mm-hmm. doesn't mean it didn't happen. So yeah. that's definitely a huge warning sign, even though he's got not yeah. convictions necessarily for lots of them. The, but, but the lesson that we're going to take out from this little part of the discussion is, man with a tussie, <laughs> make sure you do a little bit of investigation into where this guy comes from and, uh, and find out more than just about the fact that he owns a toothbrush. So it sounds like by now you you've taken over this case. Yes, um, not on paper, but I took a docket, mm. which was unusual for us because yes. that was not our job. We were there as an advisory service mm. to detectives. Sometimes we advised a hell of a lot. Sometimes we didn't. But there were those rare occasions yes. like this one. I think quarry that the we quarry. worked on the stalker case <laughs> yes. that we worked on, mm. where it just kind of molded the drift, where it just kind of unfolded in yes. that way, yes. that it would have been very impractical for us not to have and to try and start running around arranging another investigating officer. It just would And it wasn't necessarily because the I.O. was a bad I.O. It mm. just kind of sometimes we had the time and resources and it just, yeah. Yes, but we could have never told our superiors that we're doing it because <laughs> oh, it was it was not 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 on. So as you say, we typically left the docket on. I remember the, the stalker case. I think I had it actually transferred to Mike Van or Captain Mike Van Ott, yes. who's very well known now, the Oscar Pistorius guy mm-hmm. who investigated, took over the investigation. You know, I, I had my stalker case on his <laughs> name, and this you just left on the IO's name. Yes, and, and often the detectives. I mean, they've got so many cases; they're they, quite happy if you, uh, <laughs> someone's going to do the work for them. They're yes. not too worried. Would it also be though that that kind of in your gut, you know that there's you kind of got a sense pretty quickly that, yeah. that you're going to solve this one. No, and this, you can't delay. This just, one was you got to run. This one was like 
I think this Thursday after after we we I did it, I know it's you. Okay. Okay. Now, did you get that sense speaking to him? I mean, can you when you I mean you've said previously that interviewing is not necessarily your thing, um, but and and if you get somebody back to the to the station, perhaps a Gerard or somebody would be brought, would be doing it. But obviously, you're interviewing people on a regular, daily basis, etc. You you got the sense from this guy before you'd seen his criminal background. You got the sense that there's nervousness here. There's are there were there tells? Yeah, but but I was my all, all my years is before I go to a guy, and I got his ID number. I'll do his profile, oh, so I'll see his background, and I will I will go with information to him. So if he tell me a story, I know he's lying to me already. So mm. it's. I don't ask you about all the stories because then I went out and to draw all those dockets. I went to all those places to get all those dockets and to go through those dockets and see what what, what he was doing previously. Those previous arrests or cases, yeah. yeah. Yes. Because you know that you want to get a pattern of behavior yes. here. You want and to also understand. at this point, I mean, you might know in your heart it's him. Yes. But you got you don't you have must, anything to arrest him at that you point. You must prove it, yes. So yes. that in a way gives the time to go search the background a bit more, um, etc. and yeah. Yeah. And that's the right. I mean, we always say that, you know, you shouldn't be interviewing a suspect unless you know a little, as much as you can under yes. the circumstances mm. yeah. about that person. Mm. Okay. Well, that's, that's a good, good, that's a good bit of, that's, that's a good, mm. a good lesson to learn right mm. there. Um, do your research before you sit down with somebody as mm. much as you can. No, for sure. All right. Um, that okay, goes with Tinder dates also. If you're going to go on a Tinder date, <laughs> too, you can Google search him, Facebook, <laughs> if you get his name or his phone number, see what you can find out about the person. Yeah. Especially if a guy called Jared comes up on your Tinder. <laughs> Especially. Especially. Okay, so where to next then? So during the, the post mortem, is it the whole skull was, was broken down and there was nothing left. And that yes. that haunted me and I said, I want to do something with that. And then I phoned uh, Prof. Simon and asked him, Can't we do something with it? They said, Yes. Bring the, the body back to me and I will send it. I'll do send it to the University of Pretoria to build the skull for me. So that the body was sent back from coming to Pretoria and and the skull or the pieces was sent to the University of Pretoria and they built the whole skull for me to can see where all the injuries was on the skull. Okay, so she, that wasn't she, about identification. No. That was to go, let's look at what happened to this, yes. to this body. Because, I mean, things, you can often see, like, if there was multiple blows, you can often see which was the first or okay. what kind of object maybe. But because it, she wouldn't have been autopsied at Pretoria no, or Chiron Cross Simon, he would have um, said, okay. Maybe there's that, another weapon used. Maybe there's a knife or there a was, stab wound or a bullet po- or something. At the post Mortem, the doctor who started the post mortem said maybe she was shot with a shotgun. And then that confuses me now because you can't tell me maybe, I must know what's going on. Yeah. Mm. So that's when I went to Prof. Simon and he helped me with this. Um, so that was in Pretoria, but now you must wait. It's December, it's you must wait. Um, so then I draw his, his, his cell phone, was confiscated, and, and draw all his, um, his stuff on his cell phone. And then I found a photo of him with a pair of Ray-Bans on his cell phone, took him by his wife while he was driving in his car. And I took that photo and sent it to ID kit people to try to, to check for me if the Ray-Bans that we got on a crime scene matched the Ray-Bans on the photo. And it matched. But unfortunately, it's only Ray-Bans is a common yeah. glass. So it's that's one thing that ticked. It's, just, it's one thing that you can put in the box. Mm. So that was a nice thing. So then we got all this, check it, all this. Um, but I think, sorry, with that, I mean, that's that's going that extra mile. Like yes. you say, you build up all these little things. Mm. They become big things. Sure. And I think a lot of people just dismiss it like, oh, but you know, unless you can say it's his specific Ray-Bans because there's a unique mark on it, mm. there's no point in doing that. And, you know, you never know how the investigation is going to turn never. and how such tiny little things, even if you were to interview him mm. and you can say, those Ray Bans we know are the same kinds you wear. That that might be enough for him to confess. Let alone adding to all this weight of evidence if you do go to court or to convince the prosecutor for an arrest. So circumstantial kind of stuff really does add up in the end. This is that again what we spoke about in our previous discussion, where you talk about to be a good detective, you've got to be creative. You've got mm. to think out of the box because there is not a Ray Ban forensic specialist who only. Mm-hmm. And who regularly looks at Ray Bans as part of investigations. Mm. But when you acquire certain pieces of evidence, 
you as a detective need to be able to see the potential in that mm. piece of evidence and then find a uh, find somebody mm. in your investigative forensic universe that's able to take that piece of evidence and take it to the next and level. And it's no skin off your nose. It's not like you have to not do no. that. So you just got to take that and give it to, like mm. in this case, you did the identikits people who the be able to that comparison, the, the skull to these. So I'd always say to detectives, it's not your money. No. It's not your time. It's no. not your effort. Mm. Yeah. Just you, your effort is to find the person and take it there. That's it. You're the person who's a, the central person who is creating those connections and bringing in Which the expertise. Which is why I always say that evidence could be, all be there, but if you don't have a, a good detective to put it all together, yes. it's not going to be used. Mm. So that's why the detective is is so paramount in yeah. actually the success of a case, no matter how much forensic evidence you've got lying around. Mm. Yeah. And also, we, we first we check for DNA and, and for, for fingerprints, so there's no fingerprint, but we check for DNA, but because it was laying in, 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 in the felt for those for 10 days or nine days, no DNA was found. I mean, so we first check for that. Yes. And afterwards, there was nothing and then we done. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. You go for the kind of standard stuff first, yes. and then as you start to as you discover mm. not typical evidence, mm. you start to apply more creative ideas mm. to, to the process. Yes. Okay. So then I went to get all this, the previous cases of him, all the previous dockets, and starting to interview all those people again, uh, his, his ex-wife, his ex-children. Oh, okay. um, so there came a lot of stuff out. Mm. But, and I think we even, was it like Christmas Eve? If I recall correctly, that year yes. we were in Kempton Park interviewing, I think, friends of his for you to take a statement. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that just, you know, the, you know, you, this Christmas this, Eve kind of doing that stuff. Getting this, this time in, in this news article, it was in the newspaper, and then it came out that Anisha was identified, the, the body was identified as Anisha, and she's now married to, to, to Gerard. Then I received a phone call from a girl in Kempton Park. She's 22 years old. Beautiful blonde girl. She said, "It's him." I said, "What do you mean it's him?" She said, "He raped. He molested me when I was a child. When I was five, eight years old, my parents never believed me." So she wasn't one of those cases that were on his no. register. Okay. Well. And then that's the girl that we went to interview on Christmas Eve. Okay. Okay. So this is all about just expanding upon that kind of character she, sketch. Of she of gave this. me a full statement and. She, her parents was friends, were friends of Gerard, and they, they was at a bride, and she said, while the, the parents were outside, and she was sleeping, he came into her room, molested her, and she told her mother, and her mother said, no, it's... Yeah. So what you have here, then you're going, well, we've got a serial offender here, who is essentially, mm-hmm. potentially the first time that he's evolved to murder. Mm-hmm. Yes. So then... Um, we done all those things. Um, you and, and Amelie were in Durban to, mm-hmm. to interview his, his parents, yeah. and um, okay. so they done that for me. And was it was interesting just on that? I mean, normally I think if you go to someone's parents and you say your son has committed a horrific crime, there's a bit of an element of are you sure? There's no, I can't be, not my. <laughs> they just like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and they okay. they they didn't push it. I was like afterwards to Elmi, it's like it's very interesting that. They aren't arguing at all. I see, you know, it's kind of the longer he's a very good investigating officer. And and they just didn't at one minute say, couldn't be my son. There's no way. Are you absolutely sure? Nothing. And I thought, wow, that, I don't know, just kind of says a lot to me. You know, yeah, absolutely. That there was no attempt. So where, were the pair, where, where was he from? Well, they were down the, just south of Durban, somewhere like okay, Toti or Coast. something in the, that kind of area for a cork really back then. I mean, this is you know, many years ago. Okay. But talking about his interview so we called him for the interview but i asked elmer to do the interview and we put him on a late um David voice analysis which is kind of like a it's kind of like a, a lie detector sort of for lack of a better word but it, it analyzes what you're talking in the process of a conversation whereas a polygraph you've got like three questions you can ask mm. but a layered voice analysis you can have like a recording of this right now you can run it to the program and we give you sort of indicators here the person's not telling the truth, here they are, etc. So it's kind of a modernish form of a polygraph, but not using the same things that the polygraph uses. Okay. Okay. So Almeri took his statement and, and all those things and then she pointed out to me all the places where he was lying in his statements. Okay. And uh, but we never told him about what we know about him. 
We just ask him this, some more questions and tell us the story about your... And he's not, not, he's not arrested? Uh, no, he's not arrested. But that was in December. How do you and Al-Marie just kind of interchange on a case? Because you're both kind of uh, contributing where you need to. And, you know, well, how did that... Just depends. You know, again, just, just because you're kind of working together mm. nine to five every day, just a case of, okay, we got this to do today. You go do this. I'll go do that. And I said, especially before Yanni joined, I mean, it was typically me and Elmery kind of often, because, yes. well, I think there was three of us with mm. me and Elmery at the time. Mm. So it just kind of depended on the day, the case, the caseload. Okay. Um, if she was going to go down to Durban, I might just go with her that she's not going alone. Um, so it could just as us. easily have been you interviewing him as Elmery. It's just a case that you guys are a team and you're just kind of assigning tasks as you go. Yeah, but sometimes it happens that I'll be in Durban and he'll be in Cape Town and Elmery will be in Java. So it's just. <laughs> Just makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So we're, 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 so now we've, so, we, so with the interview. Almary, uh, interview him and Almary said to me, this guy is lying through his teeth with all these stories. And so then we interview the mother again, Jane, and ask her about his Ray-Bans. She said to me, no, but she asked him about the Ray-Bans and he told her that night he lost his Ray-Bans. When he came home, his Ray-Bans was, was missing and he bought himself a pair of new Ray-Bans. So then, I mean, for me, that's then again, that little bit of you at least trying to say these are the same Ray-Bans, that statement now, mm. that kind of very yeah. sort of perhaps generic circumstantial stuff becomes a lot more yeah. specifically relevant. Yeah. And then it comes out that after he, he allegedly dropping her off, coming home, telling her that he dropped her of a friend's house, and she phoned the friend, the friend said, but I'm not staying there. And she was phoning everybody and looking for her for, for, for daughter. And they went to bed to sleep at night. During the night, she wake up, but he was gone. So Gerard was out that night with his bucky. And he came back later during the early hours of the morning. He said, no, you went out to look for her. So we got that story that he went out with the bucky, um, not on his bicycle, was not on his bike. And so then in the early of February the next year, I was informed that forensics that in the helmet at the... Um, on the screw of the visor of the helmet, there was a drop of blood found that belongs to somebody, but they b- battled to get the DNA out, to extract the DNA. So they ran it a few times, and eventually on the 25th of February, they informed me that the lot of blood found in the visor belongs to Anisha Fenike. And this was his helmet, or the helmet he said it's she'd been wearing? The helmet that she was wearing. Okay. So that I decided it was enough for me. I'm going to arrest him now. Without a warrant, I went. But during those, those months, I was talking to the son the whole time. And, and of course, the son was working with him. As the, the son of Gerard, the suspect, no. or Anisha's brother. Anisha's brother. Okay. Was at that time working for him. And he, so he was. My information informant from the house, what is going on at the house, because the mother was still believing that he's not involved in anything. Oh, she was so and, and we didn't, honeymoon we didn't inf- inform the Lucinia, we think it's him. Mm. So we told the son, Lucinia, I called the son and said, Lucinia, we think it's him. And he said also from the beginning, I think it's him. Okay. So I said, Lucinia, we basically check with your mother <laughs> and we all informed you that we might be. And that morning I phoned him. I said, listen, yeah, we are, where are you? He said, no, we are still at the house. I said, stay there. I'm on the way. But if we arrive there, you must just stand one side because we're going to come to arrest him. Okay. So myself and, and Monet Toy went that, that morning and arrested him and told him, listen, yeah, I arrest you for the murder of Anisha Fenica. And he's, what was his attitude? No, he said, why? You're a wrong person and blah, blah, blah. It can't be. Then I know he's got firearms. So I said, I want the safe keys. I want the firearms. So I took the firearms away from him and uh, confiscated the firearms. And we arrested him, took him straight to Valbegin police station. Was that partly because you thought a firearm might have been used? Had you gotten those results back saying, look, this was not a shotgun pellet or this, it was, or was it just because you thought... Just because there's mm-hmm. firearms. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was on his name. And his, the only thing is that we got extra is the firearms. Yeah. So I took the firearms away. Okay. Um, and, and what does that mean now as far as 
how long can you hold him for before prosecuting or before laying a charge against him? Or? 48 hours. Okay. So, so this is the start of that 48 yes, hours. Yes. So the Monday he was arrested, took him to the Albuquerque police station, and now the wife is phoning. You make a big mistake. It's not him. Because uh, what is her view? I mean, how does she describe him as a person? Well, he was the nicest guy. He was making the food, washing the dishes, washing the clothes. He was the best guy on earth. Well, I suppose you've got nothing. You've got to try and uh, stay in someone's and, good books. But her son was in... Com- well, he obviously then wasn't, at this time, challenging her too much on, on no, her point of view. No. Because uh, she was only married for three months to him. So yeah. I don't think she knows him that much. Yeah. And the son was also not staying with them. He was also... He, oh, I think I he also came in from London. So he was also only a few months in, in Pretoria. Was he not concerned about the safety of his mother when I this was con- man suspected? I was, I was concerned about that. Yeah. And, uh, but Imagine they stayed. he would have been, yeah. but there's only so much you can do if that's, if your mother has kind of got the blinkers on. Yeah. yeah. So we arrested him on that Monday and took him to the station and I took his, his warning statement and he still said, it's not me. You got the wrong person, blah, blah, blah. So when I said to him, what we must do, we must take his cigarettes away. So we put him in the cell and we took his cigarettes away. Now, the Albuquerque police station, only on Wednesdays, there's courts. And there's a, they call it um, the court, local court that comes from Broncos, right? The, the prosecutor and, and the magistrate come to the police station. And at, at the police oh, the station. court at the police station. At the police station, there's a court room just for, because it's a small um, court. And after he was, and I charged him on that on Wednesday morning. and for the murder of Anisha and he went to, to for his first uh, appearance in court. Did he have a lawyer yet? Did he get a lawyer? No, that kind of time he's not even got a lawyer, nothing yet. And um, so when we were finished, that his, his case was, was reminded for seven days. And when he called, came out of the court, he said to me, I want to talk to you. I said, okay, but I'm still, take him to my office. I said, but you must still, I must warn you of your, of your, your legal rights you got things he said no he's still in custody still in custody he at said, the station he's not sent to the no, he's still at the station he said to me no i want to confess i said but now okay now i must stop you again i must warn you about your your rights everything but if you want to do i can organize for you to do it in parcel pointing out and everything he said i'm willing to do it i will just get it off my chest so again just recap for those of you who hadn't listened to us before maybe the pointing out is where a person, for example, wants to confess, you have other options. You can either say, we're going to take you to a magistrate, and then you'll tell that magistrate everything you want to, and the magistrate goes through all the legal warnings, were you threatened, were you promised anything? Or you can get an independent officer, meaning someone from the rank of a, say, a captain, mm-hmm. when we say officer, upwards, um, commissioned officer, who doesn't know anything about the case, didn't attend the crime scene, didn't doesn't know, didn't listen with the docket, nothing, who then arrives, and basically you hand over this guy to that officer, and then he says, goes through all, again, the legal requirements. Were you threatened? Were you promised anything? Blah, 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 blah. And he says, right, I don't know anything about this case. I believe you want to show me something or tell me something. And then the guy would say, yes, let's get in the car. I want to take you here. I want to take you there. Show you this, show you that. And confess, or that's usually what happens, and also show you things. So it's a really great tool to use in court if the person doesn't plead guilty because he's shown you things that only the suspect would know. And of course, said things that because that officer wasn't involved, the officer shouldn't know. And that's what he's now agreed to actually do. And all of that information is by the book. It's yes. legally it sound and solid and will hold it up It's done properly. Court. It's fantastic. And yes. I haven't come across anybody else in the world that does it in the same way. The Americans will sometimes do a walkthrough, but mm. the detective does it with the suspect. So mm. I don't know how yeah. evidentially mm. we're in South Africa. We do it this way so that you can't argue, but... You're the detective. You took me to the scene. Yeah. You told me you know what happened. You've written yeah. everything down that you mm-hmm. said. It's not my words. So this mm-hmm. is a great way of if it's done properly, mm-hmm. you can show that it, this person, the people doing it, weren't contaminated by other information. It makes you think about those cases like group, like something like a Green River case in the states where mm-hmm. you've seen, you know, they find the guy and then they take him out. So you're saying that chances are that they're not doing it. Kind of, it's not as independent mm-hmm. potentially. No. It's I mean, the it's, it's a great way to also to, to try and avoid false confessions because you can't take people to a crime scene if you in, to that specific spot, specifically a crime scene after mm-hmm. the felt. I mean, 
even if the bully cops were saying it's two kilometers down and in the bush by two meters, you're never going to get that right if you were actually at the scene. Yeah, so exactly. it really is a great way also to rule out false confessions. So uh, I phoned Captain Andrich Verlud and he um, agreed to do the pointing out for me. So uh, Captain Verlud came and, and took Gerard from, from us. and uh, Gerard, just want to make sure, not me. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, Gerard Hart. Gave him all his, all his legal stories and then off they went. And now he must not wait and see if everything happens to give it. So now he waits at the station and, and hope he points the right places. Yeah. Um, they, a lot of hours later, they arrive back at the station and uh, then they must first do all the paperwork again, sign, take photos of everything, book him back into the station. And then Andre came to me and said, no, this is a story that he tells me. He tells me um, they went with the bike from from the restaurant. They stopped next to a dirt, on a dirt road to smoke, and then there was an argument between them, and then he killed her. He left her there, went back home, told the story to the wife about dropping her off, and later at night he went with the bucky, took the the body of a from where he initially left it. Where he left it, initially left it next to Kempton Park drove to Valbekind over the fence and dropped the body there. So did you have a crime scene with any evidence? No. Did you find any evidence at the murder no. location? No. So he did point out that murder location. He murdered in that process. Point out that it was. So um, from there, he's, he said he went back again and took a clothes. And if that clothes he took back to their house, and burn it in the briar. And were they normally bry meat? Yes, and, you know, they normally bry meat. Burn, burn her clothes, and that is his story. Uh, would you? That, that that sounds like that sounds like a. He's trying to evade, mm. trying to 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 to. So Stop not them. own up to the sexual component. Yeah, sure. Is that that? Yes. I mean, you want my opinion. He tried something, yeah, and sure. she said, "Bugger off!" I, I do agree. He probably said, "Let's just stop and have a smoke." Yeah. Okay, and I pretty much think he tried, and he didn't get his way, and or did probably, or did or sexually assault her. Through, he didn't get his way, so he, he forced his way, yeah. and yeah. yeah, and then yeah. Okay. Did you find any? Did you invent? Did that lead you then to take a look at the bride? Oh, we, but it was no. Yes. Yeah, two, yeah. two months later, three months later, there was nothing there. And they used it. And they used it again in for between. Price. You know, so I mean, how just what a horrific thought the mother yeah, These are those kind of morbid aspects <laughs> of the case where you're yeah. like. Yeah. So at that night, of the, the mother was just phoning me and said, We can't be. And then I went back to the house and, and informed the senior, we arrested him. And I got his Ray Bans. And I showed the Ray Bans. I think it's the only time that she started believing that we got something. Yeah. And, did I, you, and you told her that, listen, he did a, he did a point in and she still not believe. No, but I, then she, she started to believe it. Yeah, no, she started to believe when I told her he pointed us at everything. That's why he was out that night with the bucky. He went to, to move the body. Um, then she started believing what you're talking about. Mm. And what, what, what uh, you know, how does her demeanor shift there? Because it's almost like somebody kind of starting to realize they were a part of a cult or something, isn't it? It's no, like when she was, hmm. she was devastating all four months. For, uh, till today, she's very disappointed about the story. Yeah, because uh, you don't know, you don't know who you're inviting into your life. And if you, you trust think, them, and I then suddenly that trust is This broken. is my fault because this is a guy I brought into the home. Exactly. He did this to my daughter. I mean, yeah. that, which is not obviously fair on her mm, to feel that no, way, but sure. I can imagine that as a parent, that's mm. what you would feel. Yeah, the trauma for sure. Mm. So um, did they ever speak? Did she ever speak to him? Bef oh, I don't want to jump too far ahead. Did she ever then after this go and speak to him and say? No, but his ex-wife did. Was his ex-wife and, and his own daughter went to speak to him at the south. And then he confessed to them. This is before he told you, listen, I want to confess. No, it's after he confessed. Okay. After he confessed. Mm. I think that was that Wednesday. I think it was the Thursday. Yeah, this day after the confession, they went to the, to, to the cells to in Baba Kent. Yes.
did did I just I want to go back to that to the skull reconstruction as well. So when did when when would you have gotten that back and did you deduce anything from that from that reconstruction? Oh, they gave him a, a, a report on it and said what they think happens. So they said something that must be like a big rock of something that was used to break the whole skull. Because I was thinking maybe the helmet was used. But Prof. Simon also said, no, the helmet wasn't, because there was no damage on the helmet. Mm. So we don't think, we, we know it's not the helmet. It, it must be something harder. But, and he said to, to a pointing out officer that he used a rock. But you couldn't find anything on the scene to cooperate with that. Oh, I see. Mm. Okay, so a murder weapon was never entirely ascertained. No. But it was that head trauma that killed her. Yes. Okay. And of course, they couldn't determine rape because of the stent of time that yes. the body was decomposing yeah. from you. Yeah. But I mean, naked from the waist down. Yes. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to draw some very clear conclusions from that. For sure. well, yeah, and and I mean, also the 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 actual the mortal wound sound mm. like you get the, he's getting the the added benefit mm. from his perspective on mm. covering up an easy identifier, mm. or dealing with an easy identifier. Maybe that's also a part of. Mm. Or, or potentially, to, I mean, would you have thought that that he's mm. trying to kind of dis mask who this who the victim is initially yeah. where was the destruction in the front of the face or the, yeah. yeah okay but i'm also just wondering he's transporting that body after the murder to the velvkin was there anything on his bucky oh, forensically yeah. no nothing. okay his bucky was clean clean and it was full of when we went there it was full of of equipment and stick mm. they, they selling it so it's there was nothing, nothing forensic. We check it for forensic, but we mm-hmm. didn't find anything. Okay, so now he's he's locked up. How does the how do I, how, the trial? Then now we go to we Thanks move to you. actually getting this guy locked so up. So the next day on on the on the Thursday, um, I asked if we'll do a f- full confession for a magistrate. So, so he's done the pointed out, but you want to yes. back it up with the confession in full, front of a magistrate. Yes. So the next day we took him for a full confession to Calendon Court for a magistrate, and he. Tell the whole story again. And did it match basically the pointing out? Match version? everything. Okay. Match everything what what we got on the pointing out, hundred mm. percent. And so, the, so I mean, this doesn't then need to go to a to a long trial, does it? <laughs> I mean, how does this then kind of go through the process? Is this like, here, judge, here's all his confessions. He's guilt, you know, he's pled guilty. Next day you get him. Well, you under get normal a, you circumstances, a... <laughs> he's going to tell you what actually happened. Yeah. Just but for the listener. You know, you only use a confession or a pointing out. That's obviously at the moment in time he feels, I'm so guilty, I want to tell you what happened. But, you know, when you actually then, a month or two goes by, you're getting ready for whatever. Oh, no, I've changed my mind, but now I've got this bloody confession. So I'm going to have to say that the guy's threatened me, forced mm-hmm. me, whatever. Yes. So you only actually, if a guy continues to say, I'm going to plead guilty, then his lawyer would draw up a, what we call a proper Guilty plea in terms mm. of the, the Criminal Procedure Act, yes. which is done in a certain way with the assistance of the lawyer. You have to acknowledge certain things, um, and it's signed by this person. That's a guilty plea. Yes. Then you don't need the confession. Mm. You don't need the pointing out because that that guilty plea compiled by your lawyer supersedes then any other document, and that's enough. Then say mm. right, we're not going to have a trial. Boom, you're guilty. But typically, what happens in other cases is the guy changes his mind because he realizes yeah, it's actually quite not so nice mm. being in a cell or be going to prison and or whatever and they decide no i'm not going to plead guilty then you have to start calling all the witnesses and of course one of those pieces of evidence would definitely be that that either the confession mm-hmm. to the magistrate mm-hmm. or the the um pointing out mm-hmm. becomes a, a crucial evidence but that's when the person says no i've changed my mind mm-hmm. so did was he a change my mind then? what happened in this instance no that was the friday morning i got a phone call from the police station and he hung himself in a cell committed suicide Okay, how do you, how do you feel about that, when when a, when a perpetrator does something like that? Well, <laughs> the case is close. <laughs> um, in, in in my career, it happens a few times. Okay. So if there was your guy that committed suicide. Um, mm. The, the morning morning guy was. Mm. Was murdered, um, and they, but they did it after they were found guilty eventually. You know, what the stalker guy did it after his conviction. Modimoli guy, I think he was convicted. Yes, the guy but, from 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 Rustenburg, he was in, in hospital after they shot him, mm-hmm. and 
he escaped from prison and himself outside the gate. <laughs> so it's there was a few cases in, in my career that guys commit suicide. Because it's it's always a funny question because it's you know I think if it's after the trial when the facts are there the families have got the best mm. answers they're going to get. Yes, I don't really care if a guy mm. commits suicide. I think in this case, what I think yes. is good mm. from our point of view, he did a confession, he did a point it out. There's no, there's very little questions the family could have besides, mm. but why did you do it? Yeah. You know, we know what he did and he's, he's owned it up. Mm. I did this, this is how it played out. I, well, I don't think, I'm not going to do sleepless, mm. have sleepless nights about that. Mm. I think if he did it before, then it's one of those things like you bugger. Yeah, because now the family is still going to always have that mm. those naggers as to, yeah. but was it really him? Mm. Or you know, you still leave scope for for parents and families' minds to wonder. Mm. Here, I think he kind of closed off those gaps. So, yes. you know, I'm not going to mm. have sleepless mm. nights. But yeah. under so certain circumstances, I feel like if you do it before the trial, you're robbing the family yeah. of that opportunity to know. get the yeah. facts put on record yeah. for themselves. You know, not yeah. not, not yeah. court record. So, so I mean, what's what really stands out from again with these? How often do we come across these cases where it's just again a, some really interesting, creative kind of detective work that has been applied? I mean, this case, like you say, was solved in how many days? Did you wrap this up? Do you think? I mean, really, in a kind of you know. Practically, it mm. was a few days that yes. you were pretty sure you had the guy, and then it was a case of just doing the work yes. to, to kind of, and that took that that takes a few months to mm. get through the process. Mm. Um, uh, 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 but yeah, I mean, essentially here again, it's 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 in those initial few days finding those key pieces of evidence, being creative in about about how you're going to apply mm. kind of your detective work mm. to those pieces mm. of evidence, and then getting it all wrapped up. Um, this must be one of those cases that when you talk about the December cases gives you the opportunity mm. to kind of like celebrate Christmas Day with a little bit more of a mm. oh, okay, okay I, I deserve this day but but after he hanged himself the case is not over yet because he must still go to court okay he must still do a, a inquest, inquest on his death on his death no, oh, yeah I on see. his death I see. which wouldn't have been I mean that's not you to investigate that would be someone separate there. no okay. inquest on her name Oh, on her. Oh, on her. Okay, okay. So we done an inquest on her because the whole docket must still go to the yeah. prosecutor, the magistrate, to, to decide what's even if he done yeah. in this case. Okay. So we call it an inquest, and it's a, eventually a J fifty six must must be issued by by the magistrate. So in this case, a, a formal inquest was held. So all the all the statements was read into the court dockets, okay. court records. Mm. So and, and eventually the magistrate said. I believe that Harald Ver, Ver, uh, Ver, uh, Williamson. Williamson was re, uh, responsible for the murder of Anisha mm. and he So every death has to have a court conclusion, yes. you can put it that way. Mm. That is either with a court case with an arrested suspect, a trial in other words, or like you say, you, or, or you, in this case, or in a case where you can't solve it, mm. you've done all your investigative stuff, it still goes for an inquest. So there's some okay. court decision or conclusion. Mm. The police can't just close it off and file it and put it away. I mean, mm. imagine that actually. So until that happens, any docket is open. Yeah. And even then. Mur murder case. Murder. 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 Oh, murder. And even okay. then, I mean, five years down the line, you might get further information in an unsolved case saying, mm. actually, this is the person. And mm. then, of course, you can still go to trial with it. So this yeah, is just that there's there's nothing left hanging yeah. in the hands of the police. I suppose mm. you can look at it okay. that way. Um, and of course, his death also has to have yeah, an inquest. Yeah, two, two yeah, for, for. And it's a, it's a nice process for the family as well, as far as, you know, getting some real concrete closure mm -hmm. um, and that sense of justice. Because mm -hmm. a court can say at an inquest, Mr. X must be charged for this crime. Yes. That's another outcome, if, if not in this case because he's dead, mm -hmm. but you know they could look at it and go, I feel that you must charge Mr. So-and-so for the mur murder of this person. And then, of course, a trial would be held yes. yeah. for that purpose. Okay. Um, what do, you know, I mean, I think this is a, one of those memorable cases, again, just because of the great investigative work done on it. But what stands out for you from, from this particular case, you know, when you look at it in the context of, 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 of your work? I always tell the people, it's, again, teamwork. It's not me. It's getting the right people at the right places yeah. that helped me. So it was crime scene management, doing the fingerprints, doing the crime scene. It was forensics, doing the DNA for me. Mm -hmm. It was Ariki doing 
um, the, the ID key, the, the comparison for me, the cyber to, to download the, the cell phones. Um, anthropology, friendly anthropology. anthropology. University of Pretoria would help me with the scale. Yeah. Uh, Heinrich with the pointing out, and then the, the magistrate doing the confession. So it's everybody getting, yet getting the right people to, to help you. Then, at yourself, you can't do everything. It's no mm. problem. It's no way. But also, the thing is, you knew about forensic anthropology. But yes. the average detective at a little station somewhere, probably, unless the unless the the, the forensic pathologist mm. doing the autopsy says, "I'm going. I suggest we can do this, mm. or we can send this to," you, wouldn't even know that this kind of a resource mm. is accessible to them, mm. or might not even know where can mm. I get a cell phone back then? You know, where can mm. I get a cell phone downloaded? So it also is. A lot of people, it's good detectives who also know what's their, yeah. their resources. Yeah. Um, and we were in a privileged position that we kind of knew all the forensic resources from, you know, cases you worked on or where we sat in mm. head office mm. that the average detective isn't going to have and, access to. And then to. The courses we've done. Was, yeah. I was checking yesterday how many courses I've done in my career. But before, when he left, all the courses stopped. Yeah. There's no courses done by any member now after in our unit since we i mean so there's previous, no longer that that kind of week or two week yeah. annual forensic no, no. psychology no it's still that, but the that specialized courses that i mean danny mentioned in it in the in the introduction interview we did with him a yes. few weeks ago he mentioned he went to to the yeah, I mean, miami to the oh, medical you're about being able to get out of the country and to share and to get into the broader community no, around the world local stuff i mean we, local, we yeah. arranged here at the did the Bronfontein um, Forensic Pathology Service to have a week's worth of, what was it, uh, forensic pathology training? Yes. You know, not to make us forensic pathologists, but also to understand what they are doing, what they're looking for, what is capable, what is possible, that even when we get to a scene, you have a bit of a better understanding that actually, mm. this might actually be this as opposed to that. Mm. Of course, you're going to confirm it with your other experts. But So local training we had here, but yes, the fantastic opportunities where we had chances to go overseas and get trained, like the, the yeah. Los Angeles Sheriff's mm-hmm. Homicide course, or where we brought amazing trainers to come out here. I mean, like yeah. bloodstain pattern analysis, which I was a very fortunate opportunity to do by the, one of the world's leading experts who came out here, which means at yeah. least on the scene, I understand the dynamics of the scene better. Like that's actually a smear. Well, this is blood that was traveling in this direction. Hang on a minute. That's not mad. You know, it really just gives you better abilities to understand. Yeah. So none of that is happening currently. Not like it was back then. Not, not like not like no. it was. And that's also partly there was a lot of money available for yes. a certain period of time. Yeah. That you know, extra budgets given by Parliament to yes. to SAPs. And right. where we had to we once they had to spend like it was we're wasting it, but we had the ability to say, mm. we want this really amazing training. This is the world's expert. And you go through processes and, and you bring that person mm. out here. So and now that money gets spent on diesel for <laughs> power stations. <laughs> Other things, oh, yeah. you know, caravans for defense, mm. for generals, apparently. I see the guy, oh, apparently, the LH, they bought him almost a million rand caravan that a whole bunch of bases had to make money for. Allegations, of course, at this point in time. Oh. Mm. Yeah, I just oh. was reading that today. Okay. Um, but I think, I mean, it's, again, it's this hard work by a detective who knows what's out there, knows what he wants. A lot of detectives would have said, no, I mean, this is too vague. It's too much of maybe, maybe. But, you know, by hard work, you make maybe, maybe a reality. Yeah. by doing, putting in the effort. But if you're going to always investigate by negative assumption, well, it's a Ray-Ban, lots of people have them, it's pointless. You know, well, we're never going to find anybody who would have seen anything. We're never going to, yeah. then you can investigate a zero on any investigation very quickly, there, very easily. There's a lot of cases where the people said, oh, oh, it was luck you found this. But I said, luck, you make your own luck. If you go and look for it, <laughs> you must make your own luck. You don't get lucky sitting in your office. No, it's, and, and go back to a crime scene. The body can be can be gone. There's no problem. Go check. Just go check for yourself what's right. going on there. I mean, we had um, was the highwayman. We I went back after we got involved, and, and I said to the detective, "Take her back." And then we searched a little bit further around the body, and it's like, "Oh, but here's an old handbag. Here's an old train ticket." You know. Yeah. So if you just go there, do the minimum. Don't look broader. It, it's also not to to. I mean, I would imagine this is not. It's not that you're. Okay, now this case comes along that all day, every day, you've got to now be working really mm. hard on this one case. It's about in that initial period, yes. putting all the mm. putting all your focus, attention, mm. and your and really attending to as much of mm. the micro detail as you can in those the first three or four days, yes. and setting mm. the path for the mm. investigation for the next three or four months, mm. which will go. Okay, so 
sunglasses. I'm, that's mm. now mm. part of this initial investigation, but now that's going to go and it's mm. going to, and I'm going to monitor that piece of evidence until it gives me something that I can apply to the case. So it's about a little bit of condensed work and then let it, yeah. once you've set the tone, yeah. the case that, that, that's rolls out. That's why murder and robbery was so, so good of the best units in South Africa years ago because there were 10 guys on standby going to a crime scene. There's one murder case. Ten guys will rock up on that crime scene. Mm -hmm. Then the commander will go through the crime scene and tell Gerard, this is your docket. So you know you must do all the paperwork. Yeah. You five guys out in the street, canvas. Make yeah. inquiries. You guys, you're doing this. You're doing the crime scene. And then two, three hours later, come to give us, okay, this girl said she saw something. There's a camera there. Yeah. Now, one guy or two guys go to a murder crime scene. Yeah. That's just a big problem. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you've, I think there's another case we might discuss later where you say you, they decided to go check a local petrol station and then they actually f see that, hang on, there's this guy with this lady and the suspect and the victim. But they didn't describe that they, had, you know. So those little things of, let me try. Let yeah. me try. I mean, it might not work out. That's fine. But hell, it's amazing in what you can find when you try. Is, is that not kind of, is that... Is that a challenge now because of the number of investigators that are available to go out and do stuff, or is it about the, or is it more about just the lack of, the lack of good experience and lack of, uh, you know, there hasn't been enough of, you know, there's been a bit of a brain drain and there's not been enough of a handing on of the right kind of knowledge, or is it I just it's numbers? And, and, I don't know. You can give your thoughts, but I think it's a workload. Yes limited amount of people but also had a lot to do with motivated to be doing the job have a commander who's going to be that mentor checking if you've done it and suggesting yeah. things you can do that you might not have thought about if you're a new newish kind of detective uh, and of course the access to resources is there forensics is there dna how long is it going to take so i think it's a, it's a mixture but it, i think in the end if, it, if you don't have a motivated cop all your resource in the world mean absolutely nothing yeah, yeah, yeah. mentorship because that's why you Somebody must teach you from, 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 you can't go to a course and come back and you know anything. Yeah. Like the detective course is a starting point of it's your detective career. Yeah, yeah. Then your mentorship is, I think, is, is very important. Mm. Talking about going back to a crime scene, that serial rape case is there in, we would GPS a crime scene. We know the suspect is driving a blue Toyota yeah. or something. And we basically on the crime scene, yes, the suspect driving past us. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, suddenly the, the detective who's taking us to these crime scenes, we're driving behind and she suddenly just <laughs> puts foot in, I'm like, what? And we'd like chase after her and the car had been seen. Wow. And we literally it then pulled him over, us or them yeah. and us, and arrested the suspect. Right then and there. It's <laughs> like, so luck, but do also if we hadn't been out there doing the GPSing, would we have yeah. been in that position? You've got to uh, put yourself in the way of good luck. Yeah. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. Unless you, unless you find, put yourself in the path to, of success, mm -hmm. you won't find success. You need to put yourself in the right place. If your eyes are closed and you're sleeping, you're going to miss everything. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I'm quite curious. I mean, some of these cases obviously that mean a lot to us mm -hmm. personally and just because of our level of involvement and how it turned out. Um, did you keep contact? I mean, that's always an interesting question because I've never really... Uh, very few people that I've ever, from the victims and the mm. family side that I keep contact with. I mean, one has been Andrea Fenter. We discussed mm. her case before, who was murdered. I've kept, you know, over the years contact with her dad. Okay. Mom passed away. And of course, the suspect's mom, I got to know very well. And every now and then send a message, you know, how are you doing? Mm. Did you keep any contact with Yes. Um, I don't know why this case, but we still have contact each other still today. today. So I don't think it's a big surprise why, from my, where I'm sitting. It's because it was a, mm. I guess it just felt like a very personal case. Yeah. Do, what, a, what, a, what kind of responses do you get from family members when you've managed to solve a case for them? And, you know, do you, it must be a very, it must be a very rewarding component. No, I think, yeah, job. for sure. No, it's, it's rewarding if you can help them uh, try to have some closure. Because you put up with so much... Mm, Cuck stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and especially when you deal with lots of them, going back to them again, asking them questions again. Uh, so there is there is always a, a relationship with with the victims' families. 
Because mm. I mean, the one is weird because we're happy when we fought the guy. We're excited. We're yeah. happy. We're elated. Yeah. They're not necessarily going to be that happy. I think they are relieved, mm. you know, but they're not happy. I'm thankful. <laughs> they're I'm not thankful, joyful. Appreciative. Mm. You know, it's it's mm. like it's almost like a sad thank you. Mm. Whereas us as cops, we've solved our case. You know, mm. we're, we're quite elated about it. So it's like I thought mm. you can understand why very often they're happy, but you're not a happy feature in their life. Mm. No, of course <laughs> not. I get that. You know, I get and that. it's, it's sometimes those special cases, like yes. you say, where you mm. still do have contact all these mm. years. It's those, just those very mm. rare cases where, you know. Yeah, but I can imagine when it's not about it's not about somebody being happy. It's about a, a kind of affection, I suppose, mm. that the mm. that the family members would acquire because you've come and 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 been such a significant player in such a traumatic, mm. difficult mm. Mm. part of their life. Absolutely, you know, and 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 just and anyone that kind of contributes to, to closure, to 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 a sense of justice, mm. to a sense of creating some kind of take away that can allow you some mm. kind of peace mm. the people responsible for that you know i can understand mm. how that you must be held in mm. very high regard by people who you know who you come across and you and whose lives you affect mm. so you know, there you go there's a good motivator guys if you want to get into law enforcement it, you know we're always we're often talking about the hardships and the difficulties especially in the context of the police today but never forget that there is there, you know, knitted into this kind of work is is a is a you know an ability to make a contribution to society that is really really profound mm. and meaningful, and the reward that you can take away from that, I can mm. imagine, is you know mm. it, it contributes to to you living a, a pretty rewarding life. Mm. You know, even though you kind of, I'm sure that you struggle with 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 uh, bad mm. pictures in your head sometimes. Yeah, and I think. Um you know, I've had prosecutors who listen to these podcasts, and I'm sure there's there's cops out there. And it'd be interesting if you are police or prosecutors mm. actively serving, mm. and you listen to this. It'd be interesting to know: is it is it helped you? Has it made you think? Of, you know, do you think it's improved your way that you would approach cases? It'd be interesting to hear from people. Mm. Um, I know Henry Horn, who who won one of our previous uh, competitions. He's yes. actually a, at then he was an, an aspirant prosecutor, newly appointed prosecutor, going through the training. And I think he's now finished that and he's working and prosecuting. And once or twice, he's told me, hey, I've got this. Who should I speak to? And I've referred him on to Colonel Fertenberg in the past. Oh, okay. um, and it'd be interesting to hear from our listeners who are serving members of law enforcement or prosecutions. That, what do you find value in these, in, in listening to these podcasts? It would just be interesting to yeah. see how that's maybe affected some people's work. Absolutely. That would be nice. For forensic pathologists. Yeah, so we can feel be. some... some so I can also share in this feeling like like I can also take some reward out of I'm making some kind of a contribution to society, Absolutely. to the world. <laughs> I've got a hell of a lot of work to do to catch up with you two, though. Yeah. That's the that's the problem. Um, what you know? What I want to ask before we wrap up today: what 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 other cases, Yanni? Do you, do do you do you envisage we can discuss in the future? Let's talk about some. Let's let's mark some future cases we can discuss in the minds of folks. What are some of the really the really interesting serial cases, maybe. Let's let's I set up the, one or two. Worth one for me, which is mm. one that I wasn't really involved in, so you can really give which insight. Which one was that? Sorry. Um, in so the Eastern Cape. Um, in a nutshell, what would you say? The serial murder case in Butterworth well, was was a um, village outside Butterworth, so sixty kilometers from Butterworth. I think it was twenty-one people was murdered there. Oh. Babies, little old people. Little small community. Yeah, yeah. literally a rural community yeah. in the Eastern Cape. That's the one we'd be close off the whole community and took everybody's DNA. Oh, yeah, we we must, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think yeah. we must definitely unpack and that. Well, whatever else well can, can we can we kind of like pencil you in for some future episodes <laughs> where we can discuss some of your interesting cases? How does that sound? That's all good, thanks. Okay, great. That would be awesome. Um, uh, other than wrapping up now, do you have any other final comments that you want to make? No, I think it's just together. Great opportunity to hear from the people on the ground who are doing some amazing work over the years that we haven't been able to hear from because mm. of SAPS's reluctance to let people it's, be interviewed. It's nice to see you guys together again. Look, I mean, this is a bit of a kind of a, a work <laughs> reunion, isn't it? I mean, we could call this work, yeah. you know, again, we're mm. contributing to, we're sharing information and knowledge mm. with people. Mm. Nice to see you guys back together. Is it, it must be, you know, it, you guys must miss the days when you mm. were running yeah. around the country For sure. solving yeah. cases, getting into, you know, having bribes, <laughs> drinking lots of red wine. 
yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad we found a found a reason to 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 bring you guys back together every now and again, um, around the the stuff that 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 kind of bonded you together in the first place. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I mean, this was great. It was lovely to be able to kind of get into the. I lo- always love getting into the detail of a case, and I'm sure our listeners do as well. Where we can really kind of go through a case, and it's always interesting because inevitably in these cases we find these really unique pieces of evidence or these really unique directions that a, that a, that a, that a case took that again shows what incredible investigators, what incredible minds, what great uh, technology we have access to in the police. Unfortunately, right now, it's all a little bit, it's not maybe as streamlined and as effective as and efficient as it could be. But I think these discussions remind us that there's always there's always hope for law enforcement in South Africa and that we do have a, a good skill set and cases do get solved um, well. And um, hopefully that can yeah, be more and more like the the, the the reality for us here in South Africa when it comes to law enforcement, that um, more of these kinds of cases and more of these kinds of investigations that are really successful are a part of, part of the world we live in. Um, mm. um, thanks very much, guys. Um, Yanni, it's always a, it's a pleasure as always to have you on the podcast. Gerard, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, guys. And um, much. have a lovely thank rest you. of your day. Absolutely. Thank you too. And uh, to all our listeners, rest easy. <laughs>